give you some background. So I was born and grew up in Syria. I moved around quite a lot. Uh, I, lived, uh, I live in the UAE, in Turkey, in Jordan. Uh, I worked in Latvia and Germany and now I live in the UK. Uh, my job is basically to help big companies and big businesses uh, deliver products faster, uh, deliver more higher quality products. I work with teams of developers just to help them uh, be able to do a better job and be able to, do it to get better at what they do. Uh, my favorite city is Istanbul. Have you guys been to Istanbul? Has anyone here been to Istanbul? Okay, yeah, thank you. It's a really nice city. And by the way, if you like the city, you should check, you should check out Celtic Istanbul. It's an Instagram account, it's so hilarious. Take a look at it. So, so our talk today is going to be about uh, front end testing. Uh, it's going to be about. So, uh, I see this problem quite a lot when I join teams. Uh, you see this problem where they always have some, t most of the times they would have some really good tests for their back end, but some really, really bad tests for the front end. So it would be like, so it would be something like, uh, they would have 100% test coverage for the back end, and they would have something like 10% for the front end. And I see this issue quite a lot, which is why I wanted to do this talk, just to give you some ideas on how, th how this can be tackled. It's a really big issue, and I think a lot of people struggle with it. So here I'm going to just share with you some thoughts on how we can improve this. Uh, hopefully it will help you. So the thing about front-end, the thing about front-end tests is that it's slightly different than back-ends. So front-ends typically run on different platforms, they run on different environments. Uh, you know, you have different browsers, you have different devices. It's unlike back-ends where you can control the environment. In front-end you just can't control anything. Uh, and you, because of that, you tend to have a lot of bugs that have to do with uh, different behavior between different environments and the way you integrate them together. But you also tend to have the other issue of a lot of users interacting with your apps. And because it's a UI, you get this weird behavior, like someone tapping somewhere they're not supposed to, and then tapping again, and then scrolling up and down. And you get all these weird bugs. You get someone hitting back and forth. The browser history is one of the biggest uh, one of the things that cause most problems, uh, most bugs in front ends. And uh, the, la the other point is that the tests always, uh, most of the times, tend to be crap. So you tend to see tests that you can't really read. And then because of all the frameworks that we have, we have, you know, uh, typically you would have, in a typical setup, you'd have React, Redux, React, Redux, uh, Redux Saga, you'd have like 50, 60 frameworks that if you want to actually write a test, about something as small as a React component, you would have to interact and you'd have to set up some boilerplate for about four or five libraries and four or five frameworks just to be able to run one component. So that tends to make things really hard to read but also really, really hard to write. And that tends to be why people try and stay away from writing tests for front ends. It's just that they don't want to deal with this thing of having to you know, create a Redux store and initiate some Redux saga and then add in all the reducers and then just combine all of them just to test one component. So that tends to be why people, most of the times, tends to be why people actually stay away from uh, writing tests for the front end. And it's just mostly because, uh, it's, I mean, the reason you have all these software is because you can't really predict the behavior. So you tend to have a lot of library, libraries that try to unify the behavior between different environments and browsers. However, hopefully, we're going to find some way to deal with this. We're going to find some way to make this uh, more bearable, to help people, to help you guys and help everyone in your teams enjoy writing tests rather than just staying away from them and thinking that this is bad. And to start, so there are going to be, uh, so there are gonna be three, st uh, three tips or three points I want to mention. Uh, so th just the this very, uh, very wide three points. If you just keep them in mind, hopefully it will, it will make things way, way better and easier for you. Uh, so let's start. So first one is, I think this is one of the most important as well, is just know where you are, know where you stand. So you tend to see, in a, uh, I'm not sure, how many people here use a continuous a CI, continuous integration for the tests? Okay, quite a lot. So quite, and how many of you tracked their test coverage? Okay, not as much, but. So, the thing that people don't tend to do is they don't, they don't know where they are, they don't know where they start, they just don't care. So you would see people, uh, you know, they would have like 10%, 20% test coverage, they actually don't know. And when you ask them, they say, I don't know. 
How many of you know what's the task coverage for the front end? Okay, 30 something? Cool. Okay, so that's the first, the, the first thing. The first thing is you have to know where you are, you have to know where you stand and how you're moving forwards. So you need to measure where you are, you need to actually have, use some tools to actually collect this coverage. You can't just not use anything. And you have to automate. You can't just check it manually every time. You can't just go every day and see, see what your test cover is. You have to actually automate this. And the best thing here that I really like about these tools is you can actually enforce a threshold. So you can say, our test coverage today is 30%. Maybe we're not going to move any forward, but I'm not going to let anyone bring it down. So you set the threshold to 30%. And then you know that you can't go back. You can only go forward. So that will be the first step to do. So you just know where you are and you know that you're not moving back. And then, so then, tools. So the best thing about, uh, so the best thing I would do when I join new teams, the first thing I would do to fix this after automating the running of tests is use something that will help you visualize where you are. So something like CodeCov or Coveralls or uh, uh, Code Climate. These tools basically show you graphs like the one we saw before, where you can actually see what your test coverage is today, where it was yesterday, and how how the trend is going. So you can actually predict or see whether you're going forward or backward. And these tools help you. Sorry. So these tools help you. They give you something called patch coverage, which I find really helpful. Patch coverage is when you make a patch, i.e., uh, a pull request. You can actually see how that patch affects your entire test coverage. So you have a pull request uh, that would say have no tests in it, and they would add more features, and would tell you that this thing is actually going to decrease your test coverage by say one percent or half a percent. So. These tools also allow you to enforce something. So you can say, if you want to move forward from today, you can say that my test coverage is at 30%. I'm aiming for 80. So from today, I'm going to enforce a batch coverage threshold of 80%, which means that everyone who writes a new feature, they have to follow the 80% threshold, not the 30% that you had for your entire project. And this just helps you always move forward. So if you just do this, but uh, it depends on your team size, but hopefully within one, one month to two months, you'll actually reach that target if you're setting for yourself using the patch threshold. And this is what it looks like. So when you open a, get, uh, a pull request on GitHub, you would see that, so this is using CodeGov, and you would see that CodeGov actually posts a comment on your pull request that would tell you that this change that you're making, the code coverage for your project is 88%, but the code coverage for your diff for this thing that you change is actually 100%, which is what we try to aim for. So if you just keep this hundred, if you just focus on the diff coverage and you just try and increase it, that will just help you move forward without having to actually, you know, uh, track it every day and just without having to be there every day and checking it every day or like chasing everyone to write tests. So that's that's what I mean by diff coverage. And you have the same with code climate, for example. They would show you that actually when you make a pull request, they would show you that you did not, uh, so they would have a status check that would tell you whether you've increased or decreased the coverage, and then if, if, if you decreased it, then you can just reject the pull request until uh, the guy who opened it fixes that. So that's what we mean by diff coverage, and that's why it's helpful. It's also very helpful, especially, it's more helpful than a coverage threshold, because sometimes you're actually deleting stuff, and when you're deleting stuff, you're not adding any tests, you're just removing stuff, and you're removing tests, which means that you're actually decreasing the overall coverage, which is in that case fine, so that's why I think you should focus more on the split coverage rather than on the overall coverage for your whole project. It's just more helpful and it's more valuable. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the next one is focus on the big picture. So, so as, we uh, as we said before, most of the issues tend to be uh, because there are a lot of environments, because there are a lot of frameworks, because there are a lot of integrations, and you have to, you know, you have to keep all of these in, things in mind. It's just, it's just really annoying and frustrating. And it's like you have to test one function, you have to set up five libraries and import 50 things just to test this one function. But unit tests are not the answer. Just testing a selector or testing a reducer and readout is not the answer. Splitting your components into presenters and containers and then functions like map state to props, all these things and then testing them individually just so you don't have to deal with this setup is not actually the answer. And as an example you can see, you can have your unit you know, tests working, but that doesn't mean anything. It's just like that. It's like <laughs> so focus on the big picture. 
So, unit tests are really useful. They're very handy, but they're not enough. The thing about UI, as we mentioned, is integrations. And that's why you have to always test that. And the way I would do it is by doing functional tests. So, functional tests are more, are more like you just test the thing as a unit. So, say you have a page. You test the page as a unit rather than testing it as tiny parts. So, you still are testing within your app. You're not testing integration with other systems. It's still manageable. It's still just some code in your code base that has no dependencies on other services. But it just tests the integration, not just, uh, not just how one function works, but more like how three, four functions interact with each other. So things like mounting a component, triggering a click action, and then expecting something to happen later. Not expecting a function call, but expecting a change in the state. So that's kind of behavior tests and functional tests. It's, uh, it's really easy now, if nowadays, to use tools like Enzyme and Redux Saga test plan rather than using uh, uh, React test utils and the test, uh, uh, the test uh, renderer. You also, so the other point is that because of this variety, not, don't only test your, uh, test your code on one browser or in Node and that's it. Try and test it on different browsers. Try and test it on different devices. A lot of the issues that you have are issues because of browser incompatibilities, not because uh, something is not working in your code. It's just the browser's fault, but you have to, you always have to consider that. So try and test your code on different devices and different browsers. You don't have to test it all the time. You don't have to do it on every commit, but try and have your tests run at least once a day or once a week on some service that will let you run your tests on different uh, browsers and devices. So you have a lot of tools that actually allow you to do it, and it's pretty easy to do. You can just take any Selenium test and you can plug it into any, almost any of these services. It will let you do it. So you have Modern IE by Microsoft. You have Source Lab, Selenium Grid, and AWS and Device One. And with these services, basically, you just give it, give it your test and say, run it on these 100 devices. And they will tell you afterwards that it passed on like 90 out of 100, and this is what happened. These are the devices that it doesn't work on. Maybe you want to check them. So try and use that. Don't just use the test runner, whether it's Jest or you know, Ava or whatever you use and make use of the testing pyramid. So that's the other point. That, that's something that I always keep in mind and try to, help to ask people to always keep it in mind when they're thinking how they want to write tests. So you have different levels of tests, and these levels come with different uh, costs. So the cost to implementation and the cost to running for, e for each of these levels is different. So you have end-to-end uh, -end tests, you have integration tests, you have behavior tests, you have unit tests, functional tests. Typically, anything that you run in your code, anything that has nothing to do with other services, anything that doesn't have any external dependencies, is a unit test, or something that you can run on every change. So that level, that's, that should be the biggest, that should be most of your tests, and you should be running that on every change. You should be running it on every pull request, you should not accept anything without these tests, and they're really cheap to run. Typically, it would be five to 10 minutes in a big project, so it should be fine. And then you have integration tests that test integration between, say, microservices or between your front end and your back end. Uh, these tests would test one thing, like, say, uh, just making an API call and expecting the right result. They're also really helpful. They're easier to run, uh, they're harder to run the unit tests, but easier to run the end to end tests. And, uh, so it's good to run them, but you, always, you shouldn't run them on every change. It's just they tend to be more expensive. You, if they break, you shouldn't really break your deployment because. There might be something not working in your environment, in your production environment, and your integration test is going to fail, but you have to deploy a fix. So these should not be, uh, your deployment process should not depend on them, so you shouldn't really run them all the time. But then you have end-to-end -end tests, and end-to-end -end tests, in my opinion, are really, really cool. We, I think you all know what end-to-end -end, end -to -end tests are, right? Yeah? <coughs> no? Yeah. So, okay, so for, you, for those of you who don't know, end-to-end -end tests mean that instead of saying, this is what I expect my code to do, you say, this is how I expect my app to behave, or this is how I expect my front-end or website to behave. So you go and say, open the homepage, click on this button, mm -hmm. click on that button, expect, uh, add this product to basket, expect the basket to talk to be that, go to checkout, type the card, credit card number, do checkout, and expect to get all the confirmation email or something. That's an end-to-end -end test. It's a one journey for the user. And these tests are really cool in making sure that you don't break things. So I used to work in a team where we did about 30 deployments a day, and the team was quite big, it was like 20, 30 people doing 30 deployments every day to production on like 20, 30 microservices and, uh, and uh, apps. And uh, we had some end-to-end -end tests that we actually run every five minutes. So we had end-to-end -end tests that would go on critical journeys, something like, uh, like buy a product. So we always want to make sure that our core 
uh, our core uh, journey is buying a product. It was an e-commerce website. And we, need, we wanted to make sure that people can always buy things. We wanted to make sure that if anyone breaks that, that's the most important journey. If it breaks, we want to know immediately. Or we can't, so we can rely on unit, you know, on unit tests and integration tests, but end-to-end -end tests t tend to never change. You, you rarely change your journey. So we had these tests running in production every five minutes. It's only on the critical bars. We had like three or four tests. And every five minutes, uh, you would have this whole test that would run and make a real order on your production environment and would tell you if it works or not. We used a tool called uh, New Relic Synthetics, which are synthetic tests. They're basically selenium tests that would just run every five minutes. And it would send you an email, it would send you a message to Slack it, uh, when anything breaks. And, be, and then you would instantly know, because you're having so many deployments, because everything is going straight to production, you want to know is immediately if you break something. So we were able to know immediately whether anyone broke anything, without knowing where exactly, but then you can look at the logs to see what broke. But it was really, really helpful to have this confidence that I'm just going to deploy this, it might be an experiment, it might be crazy, but I'm going to know for sure if it breaks, I'm going to immediately know that it broke. And it was a front end that would break, not the back end, and I would immediately know. This thing would test everything, not just the front end, but it's really, really handy to know immediately uh, whether you break your front end or back end or anything in your production. The cool thing about end, end tests is only when you run them in production, you would run them, you would make a real card payment, you would make a real order, and then you would cancel it, or you would agree with the vendor that these orders should be ignored. But you would actually run the test exactly how your user would interact with your app, and you would know immediately if you break anything. So that's what we mean by end to end tests, and that's what we mean by the pyramid. These tests are really expensive. Uh, on New Relic, they're pretty expensive to run. They're really, really expensive, but then they're definitely worth it. They give you the confidence to just go and deploy 30 times a day in a big enterprise without actually having to worry, because you know that if you break something, it's fine. You know for sure that your core journey is not broken, and then you can detect bugs and fix them while being more relaxed. If you break something, you know that not everything else has, broken, has been broken. Uh, so one thing here as well is that Whenever you have a bug, whenever you find an issue in your website, you should write a test. Because you don't want to have bugs. You want to stop bugs as much as possible. And if you fix something, if you made a mistake, and then uh, you broke something, you made a mistake in your code, and then you fixed it, you should not allow someone else to come again and make the same mistake. You should have some way of actually making, sh that, making sure that that doesn't happen. And that's why you use the pyramids. So every time you break something, just think about, what if someone else comes, in, comes after me and he makes the same mistake, not realizing what I've done? And just think about how you can prevent that. Think about how you can write a test to prevent that, and then decide where that fits in the, in the pyramid. So if it's something that has to do with code, like adding two numbers, just write a unit test for it. But if it's something that has to do with clicking a few things after each other, then we have to write an end-to-end -end test, and that's what we mean by the pyramid. Think about how, how, what you want to test, what you want to test the integration between, but also think about how easy it is to run and how cheap it is to run, and whether it's worth running, say, every five minutes or on every change. Uh, so that's what we mean by this. That's what we mean by the cost. It's just that it actually costs more money, and it's actually uh, slower to run, which then blocks your developers, and then wastes your developers' time waiting for tests to run. So just be mindful of that. And the last point. So test code is not production code. So, a lot of people tend to optimize their test code, and I just go crazy. I'm like, why? Like, why are you spending time making sure that it just takes two milliseconds instead of four? It doesn't really matter. So, optimize for change and optimize for deletion. What we mean by that is that your tests should be independent, and you should be able to delete one test or delete something or change one test without having to break everything else. So. You see, so there's one very common mistake that I tend to see. It's when you see tests and you can't really read them because, uh, because you would have a test that would basically, you would have a test suite like uh, in Jest that would be like, create this component and then you have some test cases and it would be like, do this action, then do that action, then do that action. And the, the, the test cases would actually be actions, they wouldn't be like uh, an independent thing. Which means that you can't really go and change any of the tests. You can't go and skip one of the tests because the others would break. So they're not really independent. That's a really, really common mistake you see in front ends. But then that means that, say you had an edge case for a product, like uh, you have an e-commerce website and you have some, uh, uh, so you sell like gifts and appointments or, or like bookings and gifts. 
and then you want to say you stop doing GIFs, so then you want to delete all the tests that have to do with GIFs, suddenly you see the other tests breaking and then you have to change them. Every time you change the test, you lose the confidence because there's a chance in breaking it. So try and make your tests as independent as possible so you don't really have to change any tests if you haven't touched the code related to it. Don't repeat yourself. That's, that's like, you know, that's very important, but not in tests. In tests, you should always repeat yourself. You should not try and be smart and, you know, share things and have common functionalities that are only used in two, uh, in two task suites or something, but then you just abstract it and you put it in a separate file. It's not worth it. Don't do it. It's just going to make your life harder and it's going to make you maintaining your tests harder. It's going to make them more entangled and it's going to make them less independent. Don't think of your tests like production code. It's not important if it takes one second or five seconds to run. You can optimize for that if it gets, like, if it gets really painful, but it doesn't really matter. It's not your users that are going to see, be seeing how this code performs, so don't even think about it. And your test should be optimized for deletion. So again, as we said, if you're removing a feature, you should be able to remove the tests that are related to that feature, but you shouldn't test and you shouldn't touch anything else. You shouldn't be deleting one thing and then having to change 50 other tests because they broke somehow, because they were dependent on this. So try and keep your tests as, in uh, as separate as possible. Try and not have some shared fixtures and uh, some shared data structures uh, between like three or four tests because a lot of the times you tend to be changing things in your fixtures. And again, you don't want to change one thing for one test and have three others break for some reason. So try and keep them as independent as possible. Ideally, every test, every test case or every test suite should be independent and you should be able to delete it and it shouldn't affect anything else. Same thing for data fixtures. They should be inside it and if you change any of them, they shouldn't affect other tests. So try and keep them as independent as possible. And don't split your tests across 50 files or like three files. So don't have a test that is in five files and then you have to read all of them to figure out how it runs or what it does. Try and keep them as independent, as small, as, as, uh, as close to each other as possible. Keep them in one file, uh, uh, ideally even next to each other in like, in, you know, uh, as like one file in one place. Uh, don't just, uh, don't just, you know, put your tests, put one test in 50 places. And lastly, so we have this golden rule that I heard about, I heard about three years ago. There was like a Hacker News post about it. No code is better than no code. So the philosophy behind it is that you should not write any code uh, if you don't need it. You shouldn't have any code that's there because you might need it one day. You shouldn't be over-engineering things. You shouldn't be writing for edge cases that you know are not going to happen. So that's a really, really good philosophy and I've been a big fan of this. That was my philosophy for the last few years. But then I learned <coughs> Else. And the pattern rule. So the pattern rule is no code is better than no code unless it's test code. So don't think about that when you're writing tests. Don't think that, oh, I don't need to write it. No, it's better to have a test that covers something without you needing to cover it because you don't know. Maybe you're going to delete something else that overlaps with it at one day. So try and tr tr follow that rule. It's an amazing rule, but don't follow it when you're doing tests. Tests are not bad, and the more you have them, it's better. It just gives you more confidence. And that's all. Thank you for it. And remember, you can do it. Question. So, so I have this example. Uh, 
So this is like a re React Redux example. It's just a simple component product list. Uh, basically, it's just a list of products with links to them, and it just has a non-click handler across, not this bunch across, and just one uh, selector and uh, you know and one uh, one dispatch function. But then I have two examples of tests. See so yeah, how these tests where uh, so this is a typical test where they tend to break things to unit tests. Uh, you have an independent test for everything. You can see it's fine. It's not really bad. It covers 100% of the code. It's all good. It, run, it runs all three parts independently, but it's all fine. But then if you look at something that actually does all this boilerplate in every case, like what I do here is I create the state, create, create a new producer, create a new store, and I create a wrapper, and then do the test. It's not really that bad. It's not really much bigger. When you try and combine things and do some integration tests, you don't have to do setup as much for like every single unit. So it's not that much setup anymore. It's just, it's pretty simple. It's not that bad. Yes, it might sometimes get crazier, and yes, sometimes you're gonna have to do like 50 lines of setup for one line of test, which is actually in this case, if you look at it. It's like one line of test, and you have five lines of setup. But if you compare the two test cases, these two cover exactly the same thing. But if you compare them, this is actually bigger. Doing smaller parts and having, not having a lot of shared things is actually bigger, and it takes more time to write than to write something that's smaller, more compact, and just one line of test, five lines of setup, that's completely fine. And I could have, you know, abstract, uh, I could have extracted these two things because this, they're exactly the same. But then say some time, say I want to change the name here. I don't want that test to break. So it's 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 a trade-off. It's just that you don't want to you want to keep your tests as independent as possible. You don't want to put them together. You're just going to end up with a. Uh, you're going to lose that confidence of. Because you're gonna to have to change your, uh, change two tests instead of changing one when you're touching all the functionality for one. You're gonna lose that confidence that your test has your back. You're gonna feel like you're gonna do the mistake where you break the other test by mistake, and uh, when you do that, you have lost your confidence. There's no point in having a test. Yeah. Sure. So, so sorry, I did not mention. Uh, I was pointing at end-to-end -end tests where you have more preparation. Okay. So for end-to-end -end tests, it's different. So for end-to-end -end tests. Normally, you wouldn't have that many of them. Normally, you would have 10, 20. It depends. If you're a bank, you're going to have hundreds, yes. But so that was not about, uh, so that probably doesn't apply to end to end tests. You're going to need helpers. Helpers are fine. They're not shared setup code. Sometimes you're going to need some setup code, like register function or something like, or login. That's fine. But try and avoid it as much as possible. You need to be able to make the call, whether it's worth it or not. But just keep in mind that if, if it's related to one test case and that only one, and it might change in another one, then don't have it shared. If it might change, it's not going to be different, but if it might change, don't have it the same. But if you think that you're going to have to log in on every test case of 100 test cases, then yes, definitely you better do a helper than, rather than write the same function 100 times. So yes, it's not always the case, but again, it's in end-to-end -end tests, it's, you're going to need tend to do more helpers, but in tests like uh, integration tests and unit tests, you should try and avoid it because the trade-off, in my opinion, is not really worth it. Cool. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please enjoy your coffee now. And if you have more questions, we will make a little...